how you are taking the sample for pap smearing okay so can you see this there is a particular brush over here can everyone appreciate the brush okay this is spatula is basically used over here this is uh, a col uh, colposcope okay by colposcopy we are visualizing the transformation zone if you can appreciate yes everyone can appreciate this area yes is this area seen to everyone this area yes, i am talking sir. about okay this is the cervix the transformation zone the area which is at the highest risk for carcinoma development okay or for precursor lesion so basically what we do once we have inserted in that area if you see we do a 360 degree rotation so this is the cervix this is the transformation zone part where we do a 360 degree rotation is done and then whatever sample i have collected i have to spread it on a particular slide as we can appreciate over here so the sample has been spread in this particular slide is this process and the method very clear of obtaining the sample for cytological study okay so less than 21 years of age no testing is needed why because usually sexual activity doesn't start below 21 years between 21 to 30 years pap test to be done every 3 years every 3 years you should do the pap testing so for example you did the pap testing at 21 years you came out to be negative then at the age of 24 years you should do the Uh, you you should carry out another testing is this very clear to everyone again between 30 to 65 years of age now in our country where hpv or the molecular testing is not available then what we can do we will carry out the pap testing every 3 years till 65 years of age but for example if you have the facility of hpv then you can integrate hpv along with the pap and in that situation if the pap is negative and if the hpv is also negative then you carry out the test every 5 years till 65 years of age and at 65 years or older again no testing is needed the Now, seravarix it is a bivalent vaccine why we are calling bivalent because it is active against two hpv 16 and 18 and it is only recommended for females between 9 and 25 years of age so slowly what happened when the seravarix is a very old vaccine okay in you know 10 15 years back it was discovered in that time the incidence of oral uh, squamous cell carcinoma in males it was not seen but then the initial activity homosexual activity started where oral sexual activity started wherein they saw that excessive amount of oropharyngeal uh, hpv infection incidence also increased so what happened then the, the second company that is gardasil it took out a quadrivalent hpv vaccine why quadrivalent it is active against 16 and 18 this is the high risk but it is also active against hpv 6 and 11 this is a low risk causing genital warts okay so what happened over here this gada cell can be given in males and females between 9 to 26 years of age and latest in 2020 they have discovered this gardasil 9 why 9 because it is against 9 hpv types so this is same this is same as before this is same the only new is these are the other high risk types 31 33 45 52 58 these are also covered against so it is providing against whatever was before and they have added five more so it became 5 plus 4 that is 9 so it is a nine valent hpv vaccine that is gardasil 9 again recommended for both male and females between 9 to 26 years of age so today we are going to start with cervical cancer screening programs wherein we are going to understand that how the screening process occurs what is the importance of the screening how it has impacted our society what are the testing available what are the current recommended guidelines for the cervical cancer screening program okay so let us start without wasting any more time if you see uh, that uh, in the past and even today in country like india cytological screening cytological screening has significantly reduced the mortality from cervical carcinoma so cytological screening that means what is cytological screening that is the pap smear that we do okay that is the papanicular staining that we are doing for seeing the different kinds of cells i am going to tell you what the pap staining is okay 
So usually what we do in this pap staining, we are taking a basic sample from the cervix, from the transformation zone, we are taking the sample and then we are basically exfoliating the cells. The cells that are exfoliated along with this is spread in a slide. It is stained with the pap stain and then it is studied under the microscope. I am going to tell you. So this is the process with a spatula or with a brush. Okay. You have to scrape the transformation zone okay with the spatula or the brush now the cells which are the cells which are scraped they are smeared onto a slide and then the slide is fixed with alcohol and then subjected to pap staining and then we evaluate under the microscope with the help of cytological evaluation so this is the basic process of hpv screening method the how you are taking the uh, uh, how you are taking the sample for pap smearing. Okay. So can you see this? There is a particular brush over here. Can everyone appreciate the brush? Okay. This uh, spatula is basically used over here. This is uh, a col uh, colposcope. Okay. By colposcopy, we are visualizing the transformation zone. If you can appreciate, yes, everyone can appreciate this area. Yes. Is this area seen to everyone? This area yes, I'm talking sir. about. Okay, this is the cervix, the transformation zone, the area which is at the highest risk for carcinoma development, okay, or for precursor lesion. So basically what we do, once we have inserted in that area, if you see, we do a 360 degree rotation. So this is the cervix, this is the transformation zone part where we do a 360 degree rotation is done. And then whatever sample I have collected, I have to spread it on a particular slide as we can appreciate over here. So the sample has been spread in this particular slide. Is this process and the method very clear of obtaining the sample for cytological study? Yes, everyone. Now, once we, once we take a smear, once we take a smear, okay, there are two ways in which we can spread. One is the manual method that after we take the sample, we are spreading. Okay. We are spreading and it is very dirty. This is the manner you will see a pap smear. This is how the conventional, uh, you know, pap smearing is done. And this is the manual method. Okay. Usually the manual method is used uh, for uh, uh, studying this particular type of slide predominantly. Now, the other method is wherein you, the sample is collected in a, in, in a particular liquid uh, solution. And then uh, by automated methods, the cells are concentrated. And this type of, uh, of pap smear is far more cleaner as compared to the conventional. So this is a liquid based preparation of a pap smear. Okay. Just, you have to remember there are two ways in which we make one is the conventional pap smearing. Another one is your liquid based pap smearing. And usually the liquid based pap smearing are used for automated image analysis predominantly. Okay. Okay. After this, what are the normal cells that we are observing in the cervical smear? It is very important to understand because these questions, these image based questions are being asked for the last three to four years. And it is also in your competency in the national medical council. Okay. So this, if you see the normal cells in the cervical smear, just you have to understand these cells. There are three important type of cells, but usually in women of reproductive age group in 20 to 45 years age group, so predominantly they are having two types of cells. One is the superficial cell. Another one is the intermediate cell. So this over here that you can appreciate, this is a superficial cell. Now the characteristic of the superficial cell is that if you see the nucleus is highly pycnotic, the nucleus is highly small and it is pycnotic. Whereas if you compare the intermediate cell, this is the intermediate cell. If you see, these are the intermediate cells. Okay. The nucleus is slightly larger as compared to the superficial cell. This is the superficial cell. Look at the nucleus. It is much more dark. It is much more compact and it is much more pycnotic compared to the intermediate cell. This is again a superficial cell. This is an intermediate cell. This is the intermediate cell nucleus. So this is your classical feature of a superficial cell. Superficial cells, basically they have condensed pycnotic nucleus as I've already shown you and these are large polyhedral cells. So this is the polyhedral nature. They are large flat polyhedral cell. Nucleus is highly condensed and pycnotic and they have abundant cytoplasm. One very important, uh, you know, finding in the superficial cell is the present of these very small, small 
keratin hyaline granule keratin hyaline granule so i am going to repeat once more all the features of superficial cell first of all these are large cells these are large polyhedral cells okay then nucleus is smaller as compared to your intermediate cell nucleus the nucleus size over here is just 10 micrometer okay this size is around 10 micrometer whereas it is smaller as compared to the intermediate cell nucleus whose size is around 35 micrometer okay now these the nucleus of the superficial uh, cell is highly pycnotic in nature compared to the intermediate cell layer and the cytoplasm contains multiple keratohyaline granules in case of superficial cell is the concept of superficial squamous cell crystal clear to everyone will you be able to recognize this in the exam in form of mcqs visual based yes are you able to differentiate in the low power view everyone is it clear to everyone Uh, intermediate can you explain one i will tell you inter i am coming the next topic will be intermediate only so this is how the superficial looks this is how the intermediate looks look at the nucleus and you will be able to differentiate is it very clear okay okay now this is the next diagram this is the intermediate cell nucleus now if you look at the intermediate cell nucleus the nucleus is usually not round it is oval it is oval shaped it is not dark it is not dark it is larger compared to the superficial cell nucleus the size of which is approximately 35 micrometer you can also see one nuclear grooving a longitudinal nuclear grooving is present in case of intermediate cell nucleus so nuclear grooving is present over here okay very very important now we have already discussed all the parameters the one important thing about the intermediate squamous cell is that that the intermediate cell nucleus is serving as a parameter to compare the other cells for example as i told you that when we want to compare the size of the rbc then how do we compare with what do we compare the rbc size with yes tell me normal rbc size is compared with the size of the nucleus of the small lymphocyte yes or no normal yes, rbc size should be compared correspondingly they are like this similarly in case of cervical cytology all the other cells they are compared against the intermediate cell so the intermediate cell is serving as a basic size reference for the other cell so the nucleus of the uh, intermediate cell is compared with all the other cells okay so as to know whether a particular nucleus is having any bad features or no okay just remember these basic these are all normal cells superficial and intermediate squamous cells they are predominating in the reproductive age group okay so is this very clear this small diagram again i am showing you now can you are, are you able to differentiate now i am going to encircle you tell me which cells are which okay what is this cell yes everyone what is this cell superficial these are superficial cells very good what is this cell what is this cell intermediate they are intermediate just look at the nucleus size and you will be able to appreciate just look at the nucleus the nucleus is pycnotic in case of superficial and it is large in case of intermediate so this thing is completely clear to you all no problem whatsoever with this okay now this is another type of cell okay usually the amount of parabezal cells is very very less you might find okay it is not very you know you it is not that you can find a lot of these cell now what is this this is the intermediate cell this is the intermediate cell okay now in comparison to this this is your parabezal cell this is your parabezal cell now you people tell me okay compare the nucleus this is the intermediate cell nucleus comparing with the intermediate nucleus how is the parabezal nucleus is it smaller or larger larger it is larger and the size of the nucleus over here is approximately 50 micrometer okay in size very important very important see just remember if this is the normal epithelium okay this is the normal epithelium like this okay and these are the basal cell layer okay these are the basal cell layer then comes the parabezal cell layer then comes the intermediate layer then comes your superficial layer so what happens in case of reproductive age group all these layers are maintained because of the presence of hormones and the uh, epithelium is of normal thickness but in case of post menopausal women or after 45 years okay when the hormones decrease there is a menopause in that situation what is going to happen the basal cell layer will be there 
okay and just your para basal cell layer will be there the intermediate and superficial cells will be very very less it will not be a lot okay so you will just have the basal cell layer and you will just have the para basal layer you will not have the other two layers in case of post menopausal women so that is why in post menopausal women you have atrophic epithelium okay relatively thin and atrophic epithelium is there and that is corresponding to the para basal cells okay wherein if you see the cytoplasm they are highly condensed as compared to the intermediate cell okay so the the nc ratio is high okay the cytoplasm is more condensed the cell is more round with a very well defined cytoplasmic border okay and there will be predominance of para basal cells in the post menopausal and the post partum state in these two condition the para basal cells are going to normally predominate is this very clear you don't have to go into the a lot of details but just you should understand the basics is it very clear to everyone yes is it very clear yes, what are superficial cells what are intermediate cells what are para basal cells okay now this is a case of an l cell that i was speaking about in the in the previous lecture yesterday we were speaking about the l cell case wherein classically what was happening that there was a classical uh, enlargement of the nucleus now you just tell me yourself tell me what is this cell and what is this cell look at the nucleus this is yes how do you write in this is superficial this is your superficial cell see the nucleus and look compare the nucleus over here which cell is this this is your normal Imagine. intermediate normal intermediate cells now if you compare this diagram from this okay these are all normal cells which are seen in normal women okay so normal pap containing these cells the woman is normal negative pap we are going to say but for example this woman they are this woman was showing certain cells look at the size of the nucleus it is highly enlarged okay slightly irregular nuclear mild nuclear atp is there and if you look at this there is a variable chromatin pattern over here okay open to coarse chromatin is there okay so basically this is the case of an l cell characterized by an enlarged nucleus okay enlarged nucleus okay variable chromatin and nuclear membrane now can you appreciate over here that there is that there is some amount of what is this there is some amount of clearing around the nucleus yes can you appreciate look over here what is this change perinuclear clearing is there with nuclear enlargement what do we call it as yesterday we had read about it coelocytosis very good this is coelocytosis which is the characteristic feature of l cell as we had seen it is the characteristic hpv cytopathic effect okay can you appreciate is coelocytosis present here or here they are not present here or here so is this point crystal clear to everyone l cell what is coelocytosis yes and how l cell looks like similarly this is the h cell now the basic difference between h cell and l cell is that in h cell if you see there is a lot of nuclear membrane irregularity very very important the nc ratio is much higher as compared to the l cell and there is a nuclear membrane irregularity which is the classical feature of h cell very very important and the nuclear pleomorphism is is quite you know marked okay high nc ratio with irregular nuclear membrane this is the feature differentiating an h cell from an l cell so is this very clear see you don't have to go into the details just whatever i have given you just go through these points that is more than enough at your level but these questions are being asked so you have to have an idea about these concepts okay they are asked in the aims for the last 3 years they are being asked such questions either in image based or via direct theoretical questions are being asked is this very clear what is h cell in cytology what is l cell in cytology what are the normal cells para basal cells in post menopausal uh, uh, women or post partum women in the reproductive age group we are looking at the intermediate and this form and the superficial squamous cell so is this very clear okay we also know how we have taken the sample okay now we are going to understand this is the case this is the case wherein there is a frank squamous cell carcinoma why am i saying is a squamous cell carcinoma look at the nucleus these are bizarre nucleus okay all these nucleus are highly pleomorphic in nature can you see this characteristic cell this is a tadpole cell characteristically found and why is this why is this color orange over here can anyone tell me 
it is showing keratinization keratinization this is the characteristic feature and the presence of these tadpole cells okay and highly pleomorphic cells these are classical of a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix is this very clear okay all the different slides i have shown you okay now we are going to come towards the testing so this is the first parameter for screening was what was the pap screening okay that is the cytological evaluation was the first and this method that we have discussed this method uh, is in place even today and for decades this method has been place and it is via this method only that we have been able to control cervical carcinoma to a you know to a large extent but some of the drawbacks of this method is that now you have seen it is a very complicated process okay someone has to take the sample then anyone cannot just do the cytological evaluation okay only the pathologist who are only qualified pathologist they can do it or even technologist can do but they require a lot of training for this process so it is a lot of cumbersome process and it cannot be widely regulated although it is highly followed in our setup and even most parts of the world they are being done there is another method the other method is the molecular method wherein we do not have to do so much of examination and so much of thing over here we will take the sample and we will test the sample for the presence of hpv dna okay this is the molecular method of cervical carcinoma screening and the current who is just recommending the hpv dna it is the newest uh, recommendation given by the who in february 2022 it is the latest guideline given by the who who is saying that if you are able to do any country that is able to do the hpv dna testing because it is a molecular method so it is very costly method okay so you should do this test and what who is saying this test should be started after 30 years of age and should be done every 5 to 10 years minimum time gap should be 5 years maximum should be 10 years okay so if the question is stating the current who guide who guidelines for cervical uh, pap smearing is to be starting at 30 years till 65 years and it should be done every 5 years every 5 years it should be done this is the current guideline no cytological uh, uh, thing is there in the current screening program in the hpv dna this is the molecular screening is there by the who now in which setting it is for those setting where the country can afford in first world countries the who is saying you should do it else whatever was followed before will be followed now the problem with the molecular testing is that it has a very high sensitivity but a very low specificity in comparison to the pap smearing or comparison to the cytological evaluation now it can be added now current guidelines in our country and most countries that are following it current guidelines is that it can be added to the cervical cytology for screening in women who are 30 years age or older now remember this molecular hpv dna remember the lowest age that you can start this is 30 years why because if you carry out in less than 30 years there will be a lot of false positive because in the age group of 20 to 30 years normally also the women they are having a lot of hpv infection as i already told you because in the age group of 20 to 30 years there is a lot of sexual activity the women are very active so in that uh, age group most of the women will come out to be positive so it is not a specific in that age group in that age group pap is more specific so in the 20 to 30 year age group the pap staining or the cytological evaluation is much more better compared to the hpv but after 30 years of age the sensitivity of hpv dna testing is far more as compared to this so the test is not recommended in women less than 30 years because of increased incidence of the infection and the low specificity of this test during this period all the women will come out to be positive for hpv dna so that is why less than 30 years you should not carry out this molecular testing of the hpv is this completely clear to everyone the role of hpv dna Re remember this is the current only if they state that a current who guideline if they state then only you are going to go for this else your answer will be uh, uh, along with pap we have to carry out your uh, cervix uh, uh, along with pap you have to carry out hpv dna so in our country if you see or in most countries now they are following pap is the main 
along with that you may or may not do hpv dna and if you add hpv dna then after 30 years you can do pap along with the hpv dna so as to increase the sensitivity of the test is this crystal clear so first we have discussed the first was the pap staining that we have discussed in details and the second important thing that we have discussed now is the molecular method of cervical carcinoma screening that is the hpv dna method clear to everyone Okay, now the screening recommendation. What is the recommendation and what is the thing that you should follow? 100%, this is the one you have to follow. Unless and until they use the term WHO, you have to follow this only. Now, what is this? Let us see this. What is this current guideline? It is not given in any other books. Okay, so pay a lot of attention. Okay, so less than 21 years of age, no testing is needed. Why? Because usually sexual activity doesn't start below 21 years. Between 21 to 30 years, pap test to be done every three years. Every three years, you should do the pap testing. So, for example, you did the pap testing at 21 years, you came out to be negative. Then, at the age of 24 years, you should do the uh, you you should carry out another testing. Is this very clear to everyone? Again, between 30 to 65 years of age. Now, in our country, where HPV or the molecular testing is not available, then what we can do? We will carry out the pap testing every three years till 65 years of age. But for example, if you have the facility of HPV, then you can integrate HPV along with the pap. And in that situation, if the pap is negative and if the HPV is also negative, then you carry out the test every five years till 65 years of age. And at 65 years or older, again, no testing is needed. Now is the funda of HPV carcinoma screening crystal clear to everyone? Absolutely, there should be no ounce of doubt over here. Yes? Is it very clear? Okay. So the basic MCQ over here is 25, 21 to 65 year is the basic age group that we are going to consider for cervical pap screening. Pap screening. 30 to 65 if it is for HPV DNA, HPV DNA. Okay, very clear. The test in case of PAP, you should carry out every three years. In case of HPV DNA, integrated every five years. Okay, less than 21, more than 65, no testing required. Is this very clear to everyone? Okay. Now, very important, one more thing that, that is there. Just remember one thing. Now, suppose what has happened, an abnormal PAP staining is there. For example, the pap staining came out to be abnormal, means you have done the pap staining of, of a person and that is so showing L cell or it is showing H cell. Okay. So after this, what you are going to do? You are going to call that woman back and you are going to subject that woman to colpo, colposcopic examination as I have shown with the colposcope. So with the help of that, you are going to examine the cervix and the vagina to identify any lesion. Now, what you are going to do, you are going to examine the mucosa. How? With the help of magnifying glass. Okay. How you are going to, to do the examination? You are going to apply 5% acetic acid or acetoacetic acid. Okay. To the, uh, to, uh, to the entire transformation zone, you are going to put this. And if any abnormal area is there, it will be highlighted as a white spot called, called as acetoacetate white area. Okay, can you appreciate over here? This is the cervix as we can appreciate over here. Can you see this abnormal white looking white patchy area? This is after the application of 5% acetic acid to this area. Yes, everyone can appreciate this. Yes or no? Over here also we can see certain whitish areas over here. So basically this examination is called as VIA. That is the visual inspection with acetic acid. Okay, this is one method. One more specific method is visual inspection with acetic acid followed by iodine application also. That is also there. More you will learn about this when you read gynecology. So uh, over here for us as a pathologist, this is more than enough will suffice for you. So this is the VIA test that we do. Now, for example, once you have already seen that an abnormal area I can appreciate over here, then you will do the biopsy. Biopsy is the gold standard investigation in any case. If in no, any option in the exam, you are having biopsy or histopathology HPE, then it becomes the gold standard. Now under the biopsy, if it is confirmed, it is an l cell. Okay, then what we will do, we will go for the conservative management. Yesterday, I had told everyone, okay, why now 
uh, you know why everyone is now dividing as just L cell and H cell? Why not sin one, two, three? Why not mild, moderate, severe dysplasia? Because the treatment, the treatment as we have seen. So I told you, if it is an L cell, you will go for maximum cases. You go for conservative management. But sometimes some surgeon might also carry out local ablation or cryotherapy. Why they are going for conservative management? What did I tell tell you? Because maximum cases of L cell are going to regress. They are going to regress. Okay. Now also over here, if it is an H cell, in that situation we will go for cervical conization, that is superficial excision. So is this very clear how you identify these areas and what is the next management? So I have also gone over and exceeded the boundaries of pathology and gone towards gynecology also. So it is going to help you in gynec. Ecology as well. Now, one of the most important, very hot question, and it is being asked not for last three four years. For the last seven eight years, this question is being asked, and I don't know many of these people. They cannot answer this question again. This is not given in your Robbins or any other book. Okay, it is a standard guideline from the FDA approved vaccine list. Okay, it is from the FDA approved, and it is asked every year. This question is being asked. Okay, and every year some or the other problem is there with understanding this part. So remember, now the vaccine against the HPV is available, and vaccination against the high risk oncogenic HPV, which which is the high risk? Yes, tell me. Yesterday we had read sixteen, eighteen. There are some others also that I am going to cover, but these are the two most important asked in the exam. So vaccination against the high risk HPVs are now recommended for all girls as well as boys. It is not only the girls but also the boys. It is recommended by 11 to 12 years of age. They become eligible for vaccination. Okay, up to 26 years of age. So the age group is up to 26, starting at 11 to 12 years. So those of you who have not got vaccinated for the same. You should get vaccinated if you are eligible in this age group, both boys and girls. Okay, so which is which are the vaccines which are available at this point of time? So the vaccine, if you see, that is available. Number one is your Seravarix. Number two is your Gardasil. Number three is another variant that is Gardasil nine. So initially, when I was in my UG years, the Seravarix and the Gardasil quadrivalent vaccine was only available. But today, in I think in 2020, they had launched the latest Gardasil nine. Okay, so let us uh, see this very important, very interesting. The Seravarix, it is a bivalent vaccine. Why we are calling bivalent because it is active against two HPV 16 and 18, and it is only recommended for females between nine and 25 years of age. So slowly, what happened when the Seravarix is a very old vaccine? Okay, in you know, ten, fifteen years back, it was discovered. In that time, the incidence of oral uh, squamous cell carcinoma in males it was not seen. But then the initial activity, homosexual activity started, where oral sexual activity started, wherein they saw that excessive amount of oropharyngeal uh, HPV infection incidence also increased. So what happened then? The the second company that is Gardasil. It took out a quadrivalent HPV vaccine. Why quadrivalent? It is active against 16 and 18. Risk and high risk. This is the high risk, but it is also active against HPV 6 and 11. This is the low risk, causing genital warts. Okay. So what happened over here? This Garda cell can be given in males and females between 9 to 26 years of age. And latest in 2020, they have discovered this Gardasil nine. Why nine? Because it is against nine HPV types. So this is same. This is same as before. This is same. The only new is these are the other high risk types: 31, 33, 45, 52, 58. These are also covered against. So it is providing against whatever was before, and they have added five more. So it became five plus four, that is nine. So it is a nine valent HPV vaccine, that is Gardasil nine. Again, recommended for both male and females between nine to twenty-six years of age. Now I am going to tell you one fun fact. Okay, this Gardasil nine. Many of you will now go and will say that I want to take this vaccine. Now, first bad thing, it is not a part of our national immunization program. That means if you go to any government hospital, you are not going to get this vaccine. Secondly, you will have to buy this vaccine privately. And the sad news is that the cost of this vaccine latest is ten thousand nine hundred and forty-two. 
okay this is the cost of this vaccine uh, this shot okay so this is the bad news of this vaccine it is very very costly okay so this is all about the hpv cervical cancer screening so gardasil is available i am telling cost. yes i am telling that this is the cost of gardasil 9 that is available okay because i have myself i have uh, uh purchase this vaccine so myself i can i am telling you confidently about this vaccine okay 9 10942 according to whatever company from where i have bought this this was this is the last cost of this vaccine okay